Hey, welcome back from fall break, everybody. It's good to see you back. Campus is not the same without you here. Yeah, you're our reason for being here anyway. Uh, this is the first event in our Asian Studies Symposium that will run um, throughout the rest of the week. And I'm Ronnie Littlejohn. I am a director of Asian Studies here. So please watch the campus calendar for the convocation events for our Asian Studies. And you're welcome at uh, every one of those, of course. And uh, so, and if you want to, if you're interested particularly in science and physics and, and such, or you just want to like come and get, get your hands on some things for the fun of it, uh, Dr. Marone, who's speaking to us this morning, will be in McWhorter in 402 this evening. And uh, I promise you, it will be fun, a lot of fun and such. So uh, Dr. Uh, Matthew Marone uh, is a professor of physics and natural philosophy at Mercer University. Maybe you know Mercer. Some of you, I think, are probably from uh, Georgia. He combines interests uh, in physics with the natural sciences, and humanities, and for our purposes, with China and ancient China. And uh, I think you'll be very um, excited to hear his presentation uh, this morning. He also works in areas of astronomy and acoustic physics. And those of you who are interested in physics of sound and um, AET and so forth may find his work um, of interest to you. He's building an uh, observatory right now for uh, Mercer University, and so uh, he works with NASA in the areas of space resources. He's a member of the Space Resources Group for NASA. So if you've seen The Martian, okay, that's the kind of thing that actually Dr. Marone is a Martian. Uh, actually, if we got stranded on Mars, he is the man we need with us, okay? I promise. And we could survive. So, um, Dr. Marone, welcome to uh, Belmont University, and everybody's going to give you a nice, warm uh, Belmont welcome. Well, thanks so much, especially the, the next day right after break and the 10 o'clock hour, and you're all here. So that's really good. I appreciate that very much. How many of you have taken a physics course? How many of you really enjoyed it and understood it thoroughly and it was all nice and simple and easy for you? Oh, all the hands went down, right? <laughs> okay, so physics is uh, somewhat notorious as being a difficult class. The class that I'm gonna talk to you about today is a class for our non-science majors. This is not the same course that I would teach to the calculus-based engineering students that would have to take it. So this is uh, appeals, hopefully appeals to non-science majors. And it's a different way of, of teaching physics. And so actually, I based the course um, on some of the inventions of uh, ancient China. And you, you, know, you might wonder uh, a little bit about the structure of the course, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Tonight, I'm going to talk more about what we do in the labs, because there is a lab component to this course. Um, it does fulfill our general education science requirements, so there's a lecture component, and there's a lab component. Um, so unlike traditional physics classes, this one is based on the technology of ancient China. And it is a very hands-on course. We recreate some of those inventions, but we do them in a sort of modern uh, methods, as you will see. And I like to get into the historical context. So when we talk about an invention, we just don't talk about the invention um, in the vacuum, but we talk about the invention in its historical context. How was that important to people in ancient times, or how is it important to us today in modern times? For example, paper. And if you think about paper, it was extremely important in ancient times, and we can talk about that, and you know, we still use it today for the most part, except electronic media is taking over, and maybe we're not going to use paper as much as we used to. All right, and so um, I try to put in the history, we talk about the philosophy, and then we do um, scientific analysis. Now, sometimes people say, well, was there really any great invention um, in ancient China? And so uh, you might find this rather interesting. This is from um, a, a book that I really don't like very much at all, um, entitled The Middle Kingdom. This I have on my bookshelf. This is from the 1901 edition of it. And uh, we have uh, Samuel Williams here. And I, I want you to see what Samuel Williams wrote. Now, this was 
at the end of the 1800s that he was writing this. And um, it might shock you a little bit, but uh, I didn't write it, so don't be upset with me. Okay, that enlargement of the mind which results from the collection and investigation of facts or from extensive reading of books on whose statements reliance can be placed and which leads to the cultivation of knowledge for its own sake has no existence in China. Oh my gosh. Sir John Davis justly observes that the Chinese set no value on abstract science apart from some obvious and immediate end of utility and he probably <clears throat> Sorry, and he properly compares the actual state of science among them with their condition in Europe previous to the adoption of inductive model of investigation and so forth. And I'll read to the next page, which is even more infuriating. Um, perhaps the rapid advances made by Europeans during the past two centuries in investigation of nature in all her departments and powers has made us somewhat impatient with such a parade of nonsense as Chinese books exhibit in addition to the general inferiority of the Chinese mind to the European in genius and imagination. That is not what I'm going to talk about, okay? <laughs> this is not what I think, but this is what was being taught in the late 1800s and in the early 1900s. And this man went on to become the first professor of Chinese language and literature, so the Asian studies guy, at Yale University in about 1877. He lived in China for 43 years, and he did not even recognize what was going on around him. So hopefully you find this troubling and annoying <laughs> and um, upsetting. Uh, I certainly do. But there are people who had this mindset. When I talk about ancient Chinese science, they say, what? What did the ancient Chinese invent? In fact, they invented a lot of things. Okay, and so let me give you this little tidbit. This is from Francis Bacon. I guess you probably talk about Francis Bacon in some of the philosophy classes. So let's look at this quote, which is rather different. It's well to observe the force and virtue and consequence of discoveries. These are to be seen nowhere more clearly than those three which were unknown to the ancient and of which origin, though recent, is obscure and inglorious, namely printing, gunpowder, and the magnet. For these three have changed the whole face and stage of things throughout the world. And who invented these things? This was a Chinese invention, okay? So we went from a man who says that, you know, they virtually did nothing, to now Francis Bacon's quote here, which says, wow, they invented these things and they discovered these things that changed the whole face of the world. And you think about it. They did change the whole face of the world. Printing, how did printing change the whole face of the world? The dissemination of knowledge, right? I mean, we're at a university, it's all about disseminating knowledge, right? So printing certainly changed the face of the world. Gunpowder, um, in terms of you know, military conquest and so forth, that certainly changed the face of the world. And magnetism, magnetism, especially in the sense of using magnets for navigational purposes and for exploration and all that followed from uh, from that. So here's a different character that we meet, Joseph Needham. Joseph Needham is probably the most famous sinologist, and um, he was almost a reaction <laughs> to the things that we just read, um, because if you read Needham, he documents very clearly all of the great Chinese scientific accomplishments in great detail, okay? So we're going from the idea that maybe the Chinese didn't really do anything to Francis Bacon, wow, these are amazing inventions, but they, he didn't know where they came from. And now we're talking about Joseph Needham, who actually showed us all of the great accomplishments of Chinese culture in a monumental set of works called Science and Civilization of China, which is a multi-volume set of over 20 or so books um, it's really amazing to read and covers everything in mathematics, in history, in philosophy, it, um, all sorts of Chinese inventions, extensive stuff in physics and chemistry and astronomy. Um, it's a really monumental work. Uh, so that's where I'm coming from. And then in the uh, early 1990s, I was in China living there and working at the Chinese Academy of Science. 
um, in Beijing. And so I was working there as a physicist doing modern science, but then also learning about ancient science as well from the museums and the observatory, things that um, are, are there that still exist in Beijing and, and in other parts of China. So I had my own little journey of expo exploration at that time as well. Um, so there's a picture of our lab, for example. All right, so in my class at Mercer, I am teaching physics, but I'm teaching physics with books that aren't exactly physics books, <laughs> okay? So uh, one is The Genius of China, and that book does contain some factual and historical errors, which I usually try to correct in class. Um, Brush Talks from Dream Brook, or uh, Meng Xi Mi Han. We have some Chinese speakers in the audience, so um, you might be interested in reading this as well. This is the English translation of it. Um, and then uh, the Moza. And so these, these folks um, were really two embodiments of what we might call Renaissance men these days, especially Shun Kuo. Um, he wrote extensively about all sorts of things, mathematics, politics, etymology of words, all sorts of things. But his book contains a great deal of physics. And so, in fact, I teach a physics course based on some of these writings. This is from the syllabus of the course. So just to give you an idea of what we do in the beginning of the course. So we have a little bit of an introduction. We talk about Joseph Needham, again, one of the most famous sinologists. Um, we talk about Chinese historical timelines and geography, because all these things are going to show up um, in the class. And then we start talking about force and motion. I mean, isn't that what you do generally in your introductory physics class? What do you start with? Oftentimes it's Newton's laws or measurement. So you may not realize it, but in ancient China they invented sliding calipers, the vernier caliper that we use today. And that's really important because if you're going to do science, what do you need to be able to make? Measurements, right? And if you're going to produce things or engineer things, you need to make accurate measurements. So we talk about measurement systems. Then we talk about the laws of motion. And so you can see it says page 175, that's in the genius of China, and then there's also Mozart next to it. And so we actually study some things that were in these ancient books. And I'm going to give you some examples of that in a minute. So this is the layout uh, of the course, uh, the steel yard balance, wheelbarrows, Drilling for natural gas. I mean, we're going to talk about some of these things a little bit in more detail in a moment. Magnetism is what we do in the third unit. Then we do a unit on astronomy. And after that, we do a unit on waves. And this is actually acoustics. And then we do a unit on optics and talk about some of the things. Again, in the Moza, there's a lot of discussion of optics and mirrors and how images are formed, and inverted images, and real images, and, and magnification of mirrors. This is all explained um, in these texts. And then we do a section on engineering, and materials science, and materials properties. And so we talk about porcelain, and uh, various other things, including metals casting, which we actually do as a lab. And I'll explain some of that in a minute. This is also where I throw in a few things like 3D printing. You might think of like ancient Chinese lacquerware, where somebody is sitting there very carefully with a fine brush, building up layers and layers of lacquer to make a lacquer bowl. Do you guys know what 3D printing is? It's pretty much the same thing. You have a nozzle that's shooting out, say, some plastic, and it's building it up layer and layer and layer at a time. Not all that different than what was done thousands of years ago with natural formed plastics. Um, here are just some of my favorite Chinese references in Brush Talk from Dream Brook. Um, you can see some of the things that he covered. So we can see things about mirrors and steel and the zodiac and constellations and lunar eclipses and uh, concave mirrors and meteorites and rainbows. These are the numbers next to them refer um, to this translation of the book, and then there are articles, and each article is numbered, so that's what these mean, um, including the magnetic compass, which we'll talk about 
a little bit more. In the Moza, I find all kinds of interesting things like the Atwood machine and the steel yard balance and things about force and motion. Can, can you see all the physics in here? Just look at those titles and you can see all sorts of things that sound like the material you would cover in freshman physics one or physics two. But it's a non-mathematical treatment, okay? And that's kind of important when we're talking about um, non-science majors who don't want to be sort of in a deep mathematical course, but want to have a sort of general understanding of what's going on. Okay, so actually, you know, here's an example, and, and I am no scholar of ancient Chinese, so I am going with a translation here, um, but you can actually, ancient Chinese is really hard to understand even compared to modern day Chinese. But in any case, let's go with the English translation here. Movement is change of position. So if you are in a freshman physics class, what is one of the first things that you learn about? You learn about change in position and displacement, right? And, and think about this sentence for a minute and what, what does it mean? So movement is change in position. I am here at this moment and then I am over here. My position has changed, right? What if I come back to where I started from? If you've taken a course in physics, you know that we distinguish between the movement and the displacement, right? Does anybody remember that from their physics class? If I have moved over to here and I have gone back to where I started from, then I have no net displacement, do I? So think about, this is how we do it in the class. We'll look at some statement like this and then we'll say to ourselves, well, is this really true? What is he trying to express here? And how does that compare with physics that we know today. Now movement is a change in position. Well, if I was teaching my engineering physics class and if I was teaching a physics class now, I'd probably write up on the board what? Delta X over delta T. Delta X over delta T. Delta X is the change in position. Delta T is the time it took me to change my position. And then from that, I create velocity. And then I can look at the velocity and how the velocity changes. And from that, I create acceleration. So I start with a simple statement like this, and then we think about the implications of that statement. What about this one? Force is what moves a body. Force, said with reference to weight, lowering and raising a weight, is moving. Think about that where it says C there. This is canons and explanations. Force is what moves a body. Is that true? You guys tell me. Is force what moves a body? What do you think? If I exert a force on an object, it'll move, right? But suppose the object is my book, and I give it a shove. My hand is now no longer in contact with the book, but the book was still moving, wasn't it? So is force what moves a body? Maybe force got the body moving, but once I take my hand away from it and the body is still moving, or I take a ball and I throw the ball, once it's left my hand, is my hand exerting a force on it? So what's moving the body? Okay, so somebody said momentum, somebody said inertia. Do you see how this is a little bit different than Newton's laws? And this is in fact how we discuss the concept of inertia and Newton's laws. We go back and we look at this in the Moza and we say, okay, well this was a statement about force moving a body. But then what keeps the body moving? Aristotle um, also had difficulty with this as well. Aristotle was saying things like, you know, that which is moved is moved by something else. And gets into all kinds of really strange conceptions of if I take a, a bow and an arrow and I fire the arrow and the arrow leaves the bow, what keeps, what keeps the arrow still moving in flight? And they have all kinds of crazy explanations about the air in the front being pushed around the back and kicking the arrow. Because they don't have what concept? What's the missing concept? Somebody said it a, a few minutes ago. Inertia, right? So this is how I would introduce the concept of inertia. We would talk about this statement and ask ourselves, is this statement true or under what conditions is it true? What about when the net force acting on an object is zero? There is no net force acting on an object. What's true about its acceleration? If the net force is zero, what's its acceleration? It's also zero. Which, does that mean that the body is not moving? It means that the body could be moving with a constant speed, right? 
What if the body is moving with a constant velocity? Let's say it that way. That's a better way to say it. If the mo object's moving with a constant velocity, that means the net force is equal to zero. So how does that reflect on forces what moves a body? Do you see what I'm trying to do? Do you guys understand what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to take this statement from ancient times and then move it to a different historical context and then compare it with Newton's laws of motion. And then I actually go and generate all kinds of equations of motion, the kinematic equations of motion and dynamics. Uh, in each unit that we study, since this is a class that has to do with ancient China, I also introduce vocabulary. So here are the vocabulary words that everybody in the class needs to know. Now, the way they need to know these is not necessarily to reproduce the characters necessarily. Um, they get it in sort of a matching form. So this is actually from a test. Okay, so you can see there's a word bank down below, and then there are some words written in Chinese, and the idea is they're supposed to be able to match, you know, what goes with what. Okay? And so that is how they are introduced to some ter terminology. Some of the students taking this course have had even several semesters of Chinese language. Some of them have no familiarity with Chinese whatsoever. And so they learn the pinyin, and they learn how to pronounce the word, and we go over pronunciation in class, and then they can fill in a word bank. So they don't actually have to write Chinese characters, but some of them do. Okay, so here's a book, Tian uh, Gong Kai Wu, and this is a book that talked about all kinds of really useful inventions. And we see a man here pushing a wheelbarrow. Again, that was a Chinese invention, the wheelbarrow. And if we go a little further, when I look at that wheelbarrow, as a physicist, when I look at that wheelbarrow, I ask myself some questions like, well, why is this wheelbarrow useful for this guy? Well, he can move a really heavy load. And when he lifts up the handles, how much force does he need to apply to lift up the handles and have this wheelbarrow in equilibrium? And so I take that image from the book and from an ancient text, and then we look at it and we do analysis on it. We look at the guy, we estimate what his height would be. We ask ourselves, is this particular drawing drawn to scale? And then we start talking about torque. So if you've taken a physics course, you know something about torque. And so we calculate the torques, and we ask ourselves how much force he needs to apply. And so this is how I introduce the concept of torque to the class. And then you can see some problems here. These are, again, from test questions. So calculating torques, calculating velocities and accelerations, like you would see in a regular physics class, but we didn't start out in the same way that the regular physics class starts out. We started out with some ancient technology and then moved into the analysis of that technology using modern day physics principles. Okay, so here's something else that we do for torque. This is a chung, this is a kind of device that you would see in the marketplace and you would take your vegetables or something and put it in the basket and the person would slide the counterweight and tell you how much you owe, okay? So this is a weighing device. Well, this weighing device illustrates the principles of torque and torque balance. And so this is a lab. So the students actually make these in class and they make them out of PVC pipe and fishing weights and this is our lab component. So we recreate this ancient invention and then we go and we analyze it um, as a modern day physics class would do it. Here's something a lot of people don't know about. In ancient times, particularly in Sichuan province, the production of salt, okay? Salt was a very, very valuable material. And it turns out um, 200 BC, the Chinese were drilling wells to get salt brine that was subsurface, hundreds of meters deep, in fact. And not only were they able to get the, the brine solution to come up, but what else was present there in these wells? Does anybody know? You can probably guess from what I'm showing here. There was also natural gas in these wells. And so they drilled, they got the brine solution, they also got the natural gas, and then they figured out how to use the natural gas, burn the natural gas to heat the brine solution, boil off the water, and what are you left with? Big cakes of salt, which at times, salt has been more valuable than gold in the world. Salt is an essential nutrient, and people 
paid dearly. There's a wonderful book called The History of Salt, and you can read about the importance of salt. Well, how did they get that salt? They made what we call a percussion drill. You can see these objects on the right here. These are drill bits, and these drill bits were hoisted up and then dropped. And so it would repeatedly hit the same place over and over and over again, and they were able to drill wells. What does that remind you of from physics? Gravitational potential energy. You lift an object up, and you give it a certain gravitational potential energy, MGH. And then you let the object fall, and it strikes the ground with a certain velocity. And so you can go through. You see some equations there on the bottom. So here's the gravitational potential energy. Here's the velocity that you would get, and then we used uh, an example here uh, where the bit was very heavy. These things were hundreds of kilograms, and they were lifted up a few meters, and then they dropped. So we could just say, you know, gravitational potential energy is MGH, and I can give you some boring examples with that, or I can give you this whole backstory about how these people were using that principle to drill wells and building pipelines. They had extensive pipelines where they were piping natural gas and brine solution around. While Europe was still in the Middle Ages, while the Norman conquest was going on, they had bamboo pipelines to move natural gas around in the city and heating systems, for example. And so we talk about gravitational potential energy, kinetic energy, energy conservation. I mean, I can't obviously go through all those details today because we would be here all day. So how about magnetism? So here's a statement. Uh, magicians rub the point of a needle of a lodestone with a lodestone, and then it is able to point south. Okay, now, most people that grew up in the United States, which way to compass this point? They point north. But if something is pointing north and it's a straight rod, where's the other end pointing? If my finger is pointing north, then this part of my arm is pointing south, right? So the cardinal direction in, in, in China, it was south. And literally, a compass literally is translated as a south-pointing needle, okay? So, and there are reasons for that, and we discussed some of the reasons for that. Why was the South important? What does it represent? Again, I could go on about that for a long time, but there's something else that's interesting here. So this is a description in this talk, Brush Talks from Dream Brook, and this is a description that Sean Kuo gave us, and this is around the year 1080 or so when this was published. And it makes a very interesting comment here. But it always inclines slightly to the east and does not point directly at the south. What does that mean? Any idea? Do compasses point directly at the North Pole? They don't. They point in the direction of the magnetic pole. This is the first historical reference to what we call magnetic declination. And this is coming in a publication around the year, as I said, around 1080, when this was published. William Gilbert didn't figure this out in Europe until his publication of The Magnet, which was in the beginning of the early 1600s, like 1601, if I remember right. So he was doing magnetic experiments in the late 1500s and figured this same thing out. And that's how Europeans came to know it. But 500 years prior to that, Shun Kuo was already writing about it. And it was old news to people when he was writing about it. So this is the first historic reference to magnetic declination. So from here, I start talking about magnets and magnetism and the magnetic field of the Earth and the importance of the magnetic field of the Earth. Maybe you don't realize it, but it's, in a way, it's kind of a shielding system for us because high energy particles coming off of the sun are trapped in the magnetic field lines of our Earth. And it gives rise to things like the aurora. So now, the Chinese had a different way of interpreting this. There's a Chinese concept of, of qi, OK? So the Chinese saw this magnetization and this alignment as more of, of a phenomena and a manifestation of qi energy. And so we talk about that. We talk about what is the qi energy, how does that fit into the Chinese cosmological view of the world. And then we also talk about magnetism as we understand it today.
Um, as you can see, there's a magnetic compass to the left. That's one that the students make in class. And on the right, does anybody know what that object is? Well, left and right might be reversed for you. So the thing that looks like a Petri dish is a homemade magnetic compass. The thing on the other side is what? Does anybody know what that is? Nope. Any ideas? So that is a device which is called a luapan. And this is what was used by ancient geomancers to make measurement of the chi to figure out where to build a building or where would be a good lucky place to build the building. And this all goes back to the, to the concept of feng shui. And so in the class, I talk about what feng shui is. There are people, this is not ancient, there are people who still do this today. There are entire cities that are laid out where a feng shui master will come and find the correct location of the building so that the building for this company is built in such a way as it will attract wealth and prosperity. Okay, now you may not believe that, but there are millions of people around the world that do believe that. And if we're going to study ancient China, we need to understand how that affects the culture or how the culture is affected by the science and how the science and the culture interact with each other. And so I talk about feng shui, and we talk about the five elements, the five element theory, wu xing. And we, talk, we discuss what those elements are. This is different than the way we think about elements, because in the Chinese element theory, there's a transmutations that go on of one element helping or weakening another element. It's not the same as elements in the periodic table, where stuff is built up from it. So again, I go into a very long discussion of how this works. And then this also gets us into discussions of Taoism as well. And so we talk about Taoism and the associated concepts um, with the five element theory. And of course, there's Chinese vocabulary with it. So we have you know, the lodestone, the magnet, iron, uh, what a compass is, all those kinds of things. We discuss that. And in here, this illustration is showing magnetic north. Do you realize that the magnetic north pole moves? It's not where it was 100 years ago. You can see in 1831, there's a measurement of the magnetic north pole up in northern Canada. And then you can see where it is in 2001. The, the Earth's magnetic poles are not static. They actually move. And so this was a very interesting concept. And remember what Sean Koa said? It doesn't point exactly south. It goes a little bit to the east. This is why it goes a little bit to the east, because the Earth's magnetic pole doesn't line up with the geographic pole. And so there's this magnetic declination, which he discovered. And in fact, they made measurements of the magnetic declination of principal cities in China way before William Gilbert ever published his book on magnetism. <coughs> we also talk about the sources of magnetic fields. So if you look there, you see this rock. What is that rock? That's a lodestone. Okay, and so that is how people made magnets. Magnets were naturally occurring. Later on, by the time we get to people like Michael Faraday and Orsted, meaning the 1800s, we find that there are not just naturally occurring magnets, but you can put current through a wire, and the current in the wire produces a magnetic field. And that's how we get a lot of the things that we have today, like magnetic motors and speakers and all that. And so we can talk about a piece of lodestone, and then we can talk about, here's the right-hand rule. If you've taken, like, you know, physics two, then you probably have learned about how you put your thumb in the direction of the current, and the magnetic fields are given by the direction that your fingers curl if you use your right hand. So we start with a lodestone, and we talk about the ancient Chinese observations of magnetism, and then we go all the way through to the modern day times and talk about things like Faraday's law of induction or these two equations on the bottom. Um, this is for a long straight wire. And that's how the field is produced by current. But notice what happened here. We had natural magnetism, that is a, an object existing in the natural world that produced a magnetic field, and then we had artificial magnetism, that we could produce a magnetic field by running current through it. And that was a great, great discovery in modern times. And so I tie all those things together in the class. We talk about astronomy, okay? The Chinese discovered sunspots and other solar phenomena. Uh, 
Now, they may have not been the first culture to see sunspots, but they very accurately recorded observations of sunspots. If you were to tell Aristotle that there were spots on the sun, he would be really, really displeased, right? So, because the things that existed in the heavens were perfect, and they were spheres because spheres are the perfect shape, and there was all this idea of perfection. Well, the Chinese didn't have that idea, and in fact, they were looking and recording sunspots. And so some of our earliest observations of sunspots, also very early observations of comets. People still use comet data that's thousands of years old to figure out orbital parameters of comets nowadays that were made by Chinese observations. Um, they figured out the solar wind. There is this wind as such, it's high energy particles coming off from the surface of the sun. The Chinese made observations that the tails of comets always pointed away from the sun. And so they figured out the existence of the solar wind. Now, they thought it was more like yang qi coming out of the sun blowing the solar wind, but they observed that there was a solar wind. So they gave a definition or an explanation that was different than we might see it today in our modern understanding of this phenomena, but still they observed it. Inventing equatorial astronomical instruments. Um, we also talk about phases of the moon and constellations. You can dim the lights on this one. The Chinese, of course, had their own system of constellations. I didn't do all the constellations here. I just did what we call the lunar lodges. Okay, uh, the lunar lodges are representations of places where you would find the moon. And so if you look at the sky from night to night, you would see the moon in certain areas of the sky. These are what some people call the lunar lodges or the lunar mansions. It's kind of hard to translate what it is. So we, we talk about that, and then we also talk about the modern constellations. So I couldn't, can't really call them modern because these constellation representations go back thousands of years but we could call them maybe the European or the Western constellations or something like that. So Orion, right? You know, that's something Gemini, Pisces, all these things that you know maybe from the Zodiac. So we talk about those. Now, I teach astronomy as well, and my astronomy course is very hands-on. And so we go out and set up telescopes. So that's what you see here is a group of students setting up telescopes with the constellation Orion in the background. And we actually set up telescopes and observe. So they learn a little bit about Chinese astronomy and the understanding of the cosmos, the Chinese understanding of the cosmos, and then we talk a little bit about modern cosmology and, and how we understand it today. Uh, one of the uh, last topics that we do is sort of general material science. When you think of ancient China, something that might come to mind is bronze. The Chinese made wonderful bronze objects they were used for a lot of things, um, bronze edged weapons or just the material properties, the bronze vessels that were used in temples and so forth. Well, when I think of bronze, I think of it as a material scientist. So I can talk to my students about ancient Chinese bronzes, but what do you see hiding up in the corner there? The periodic table of elements. So when I think about bronze, I think about the fact that I've got copper and tin that are both soft materials and I mix them together and I make this hard material that I can make a sword out of. So, I mean, there's a whole age, right? The Bronze Age. There's a whole age named after the invention of bronze. It was extremely important. Well, how do you mix these materials together to make bronze? And so this is my way of talking about the periodic table, about crystal structures, about the properties of metals. What is a metal and how is a metal different than a non-metal? Well, here's a few student comments and you can see how the students react to it. Um, this course has probably gotten me the most excited out of any that I have taken so far at Mercer. I'm sorry if this sounds a little self-promoting, <laughs> but you know, I have to be honest uh, because it's so unique and different from the other courses. I'm really looking forward to learning about how the ancient Chinese culture developed over time. These are, I have the students fill out little um, cards throughout the semester at the beginning, at midterm, and at the end about their response to this course and what they are learning. And then I put them in an envelope because I don't want to look at them as they say really bad things, right? <laughs> and I can't figure out their handwriting. They're supposed to do this anonymously and put a little character or a number or something in the upper corner so they know when they go back and fish out their cards at midterm, then they can add more comments to it. 
But I have to say, a lot of the students find this a really unique way of learning physics. And my students, I had one student one time, he said, I finally figured out what you're doing. You're teaching us science without really teaching us science. And I said, well, it sounds kind of Taoist, but yes, that's what I'm doing. I'm teaching you something without really teaching it to you, but I am really teaching it to you, okay? And so it's a, it's a very, very different way um, of doing introductory physics courses, and I hope it's a way that you might find interesting. Uh, you know, a few more different, sorry for the handwriting, but that's what I get. So, challenging, but the topics were covered were interesting. My favorite topic that we covered was astronomy. Okay, I liked it, learning about Chinese culture. Um, I'm excited about this class. The labs are really interesting. Now the labs, I'm gonna talk about tonight. So there's a part two of this talk, which are the labs. There is a whole lab component that goes with this, and we make things. It, and we recreate the technology, and then we make measurements on that technology. And that's how we do our lab component. Well, I hope this was interesting for you, and, and you got an idea of what I'm doing at Mercer. And of course, you immediately want a class like this at Belmont too, right? So, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Do you folks have uh, a couple of questions or need me to go back and show you any additional slides? Yes, sir. Do you teach any additional courses besides this one? This is the one and only ancient Chinese science and technology course. It may be one of the few in the world. It is certainly the only one that does experimental work as well. So I'd like to develop this a little bit further. But right now, it is, there is a like one science class that is required for non-science majors. And so this is a class that some of them take. But you teach other things. I teach other things, yeah. I, I mean, I teach in the physics department, so I teach, uh, you know, I'll teach a course in experimental physics or elementary quantum mechanics or, you know, any of those kinds of things an upper-level physics major would take. And then I also teach intro astronomy classes as well. So, Yeah. Uh -huh. Like they don't include the uh, Eastern elements of it, like with their uh, scientific achievements and stuff. Program. So it it may be out of ignorance that they don't know that these things were done, or it may be the Eurocentric mindset that people have, and it would be really good if you wrote to them and asked them that very question, <laughs> um, because they should. Now, we hope that they're not like that guy that we read about in the very beginning, right? And thought that the Chinese really didn't do anything. Um, so I would hope to see more of that in science programs. You know, NOVA and the Discovery Channel and places like that should have more programs about this because there is a wealth of information out there. And, you know, I think people need to know about it. It's a really good question, so write them a letter. Okay, other questions? In the back there, I saw a hand. Um, yeah. Uh, what would you say, I don't know if you know this or not, but what would you say Well, there's always the, ac the economic question because people are doing more business in Asia. And so as a result, they're more interested in learning about Asian culture and Asian customs. There is this organization that we are all involved with that does Asian studies development. And so there is more funding available for people like me and the Asian Studies program here at Belmont. There's a growing interest in that, and there's funding opportunities for that. And I think that general awareness that people are getting um, about ancient China and finding, wow, that's really interesting. I want to learn more about it. You can also see that some of these concepts were expressed in a way that are not 
overly mathematical with a lot of mathematical formalism. And so that also makes it a little attractive for students that are not um, really into mathematics to go back and look at some of these ideas. So there, there's a lot of factors there in your question. So it's a very good question, though. Others? Okay, I guess that's about it then. <laughs>